One of the greatest servant leaders of all time, and an author you will have heard of who's written many books, including The One Minute Manager, Raving Fans, and Leading at a Higher Level, but also he's the co-founder of Ken Blanchard Companies. I'd like to welcome Ken Blanchard. We hope you've got more than a minute, sir. Great to be here. So Ken, if we can just uh, talk about the One Minute Manager. When I first saw the book, One Minute Manager in Singapore, I saw it and I, was, I grabbed the book because I thought that I'd be able to be a Barack Obama-style speaker in just one minute and all my management problems would be gone. Um, it wasn't quite that, but it was a, I, I loved your book. Um, can you just tell us why is it called the One Minute Manager? Well, that actually came from meeting Spencer Johnson, uh, who you probably know also wrote Who Moved My Cheese, which okay. I wrote the forward to. But um, he was a children's book writer when I met him, and he wrote this wonderful series on, called Value Tales for, for kids. And my wife met him at this party and hand carried him over. And Margie said, you two ought to write a management book, uh, a children's book for managers. They won't read anything else. <laughs> and uh, so I invited him to a seminar I was doing. And uh, he sat in the back and laughed because he was working on a, on a kind of a one-minute scolding, one-minute parenting book. And he came running up at the end and said, you know, forget about parenting. Let's do the one-minute manager. And, mm. and since he was a children's book writer and I'm a storyteller, we decided to write a parable. Yeah. You know, because the best books we had ever read were Jonathan Livingston, Seagull, and The Littlest Prince, and Ogmandino's The Greatest Salesman in the Mall. And so the one minute was not to say it takes a minute uh, to be a manager. <clears throat> it takes a minute to do the three basic secrets of the one minute manager. It takes less than a minute to sit with somebody and be clear with them on what you want them to accomplish and what good behavior is, which is the first secret one minute goal setting. Mm. It only takes a minute to wander around and catch somebody doing something right and give them a one minute praising that you notice what they did and tell them what they did and okay. how much you appreciate it. It only takes a minute when somebody is off base to redirect them if they're a learner back to the goals that you agreed upon. Yeah. Or if they know better, uh, you can reprimand them, but you always end a reprimand with a reaffirmation, you know, you're better than that. That's why I'm upset uh, okay. with you. But those are, those don't take a long period of time. I mean, you don't want to go on a tirade for, yeah. for half an hour on somebody, and you don't want to sit there and praise them for, you know, five minutes and all because it'll sound a little phony. It's just, you know, I noticed. So I suppose it's, it's really the fact that you don't have to spend that much more time to be a much more effective leader and, yeah. and get dramatic output. Mm -hmm. Uh, as a result of that small input that you're yes. saying. So if we can just go through the three secrets, Ken, very, very quickly, if that's good with you. Um, the first secret is obviously about goal setting, mm -hmm. making sure people know what they're doing. So why is that important and what's some of the secrets? Well, all, all good performance starts with clear goals. If yeah. people don't know what they're being asked to do and what good behavior looks like, there's no way they're going to accomplish it. So right. yeah, that's the first thing you got to do as a manager is make sure people are clear and they need to know what good behavior looks like because if you can't measure something you can't manage it you know and a lot of yeah. times we evaluate people on things that nobody knows anything about you know like yeah. promotability initiative you know <laughs> crazy stuff like that so yeah how do you define that yeah mm -hmm. so goal setting is just the start of, of everything and then the second secret is one minute praising is once people are clear on goals you ought to wander around and See if you can catch people doing things uh, right. And I, of all the things I've ever taught over the years, that's the one I would hold on to if somebody said you can't teach anything going yeah. forward except one thing. Because I think the key to developing relationships in great organizations is to accentuate the positive and mm -hmm. celebrate people's success. And then finally, the, <clears throat> the third secret is the one minute reprimand is if somebody uh, isn't performing well and, and not even approximately, there's two choices. If they're a learner, you redirect them, which says, you know, I'm not clear, sure if you're clear about this, you know, let's review what the goals are and, and yeah. all. If they have somebody who knows better and has been working with you a lot of time, they just haven't been doing it, uh, it's an attitude problem, you give them a reprimand, tell them, you know, what they did wrong, how you feel about it, I'm upset, I'm disappointed and all. But you always end a reprimand with a reaffirmation, which is the reason I'm upset uh, with you is you're one of my best people, you know, I always count on you. And so if you can't say the reaffirmation, then they must be a learner. You should be redirecting them. Yeah. So they're very simple things. And it doesn't mean there's not other responsibilities as managers. But since the key aspect of any manager is managing performance, those three things are key. So 
you know, goal setting is sets up performance planning and praising redirection and reprimands are good for day to day coaching so that when you get to evaluation, people can get A. Ken, I was watching one of your DVDs where you, you mentioned a seagull manager, and I had a mm -hmm. whole Rolodex of people that came through my mm -hmm. mind. What's a seagull manager? It's well, it's probably the most common uh, management technique around the world. A manager tells people to something, do something, and then they just disappear until people make a mistake, and then they fly in, make a lot of noise, dump on everybody, and fly out. You know, we call it kind of leave alone zap, and uh, it's just not a very good way to be managed. I I ask people around the world, how do you know whether you're doing a good job? The number one response still is nobody's yelled at me lately. So mm -hmm. no, no news is good news. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ken, your book uh, was written, as you said, 27 uh, years ago. So, but it's still, the, the sort of, you know, people are still buying that, they're still passionate about it, as if it just came out mm -hmm. last, you know, last week and it's a, it's a massive new trend. So why do you think it's had such a universal appeal? And can your principles be applied globally? Because I know you've got offices around the world, mm -hmm. can Blanchard companies. Can your uh, secrets be applied universally, and are they timeless? Yeah, that's, that's what we really found out early on. The one minute manager got translated into 30 languages. And uh, after that started to happen, we started to think that we need to set up operations of, around the world. And one of the first places we came was here to the UK, and so we have a thriving office that, that we've had here for a long time. We also have an office in Toronto, and then recently we opened one in Singapore because 80% of the world population is a six-hour flight from Singapore, so we ought to pay a little attention uh, to them. But we have those offices plus partnerships in about another 28, 30 uh, countries around the world. Wow. Um, a lot of the Western organizations ha ha have leaders where there is sort of you know an eight-hour reprimand followed by a 30-second praise if, if they're lucky. But do you find that over in, the, in Asia there's different type of leaders out there, different type of managers? Well, I think you always have to look at, uh, at the cultures, you know, like in, in Japan, uh, the reprimand isn't really necessary. If somebody knows that they haven't done a good job, they feel a lot of guilt. That's just part of their, their society and also that, uh, yeah. but the praising and the goal setting and all that. So. We always have people that, that live locally that, that run our operations so that they can make any adaptations to that so it's not, you know, these Americans come in and telling you how to do it. We're more interested in the people coming to us and saying, wow, this, this stuff really applies to what we're doing, you know, we'd yeah. love to be able to represent you yeah. <coughs> here. And so it's, it's pretty exciting to, to see the, uh, the connection around the world. Ken, obviously you're not just an author, you're, you're running a, a very powerful uh, global business, the Ken Blanchard Company. So how do you find uh, that you can most help organizations in leadership capacity? Well, I think the big thing that we try to get them to understand that effective leadership is really a transformational journey, beginning with self-leadership. It's very right. interesting is that uh, one of the most popular interventions we do is we have a self-leadership program, situational self-leadership. Because a lot of people don't ever take a look at themselves. Mm. And uh, how do they take initiative, you know? How do they get what they need to have to, to be successful? Because if they can get a sense on what they need to do to be successful and what they do, then they're going to even get a better sense when they go to the next step, which is one-on-one -on -one leadership. See, because self-leadership, you're gaining perspective on your own leadership point of view, a little bit about your, your disposition and personality. You know, a sense of what your mission might be, your values, and all. We try to really help people, uh, you know, really get to know about themselves and, and what are their points of power and uh, how can they, you know, kind of collaborate for success and all. Yeah. And then once they understand themselves, then we feel they're ready to, for a one-on-one -on -one relationship where the big goal is building trust with somebody yeah. uh, else. And, and so... Uh, but that's one form of leadership where you have, you know, eight to ten reports, and and uh, you might meet with them as a group once in a while. But basically, you're managing people one on, on one. Sales mm -hmm. managers do that, and yeah. and uh, people in those positions. The third stop, which we do a lot of work on, is how do you build an effective team? Because teams are more complicated than one on one leadership, uh, and. Uh, 
you know, because if it's just you and I working together, we only have two possible relationships, yours to me, me and mine to you. But if, if somebody else joins us, now we go from two relationships to 12 because it's not only our relationship to the three of us, but it's my relationship to you when this other person is there and your relationship to me when they're mm. there. Because, you know, you can meet with a colleague before you go in to see your boss and agree on what you're going to talk to your boss about. In the middle of the meeting, that colleague could go south. Yeah. And, uh, and then finally, the final journey is organizational leadership, which is now that's even more complicated than building a community uh, that you're trying to do with a team because now you're trying organizational effectiveness in terms of performance and all. And the, the theory that runs throughout those is situational leadership, which basically says there's no one best leadership style. It depends on, on the development level of the individual you're working with. It depends on the stage of group development for the team you're working with. It really depends on what it, where they are in terms of their concerns and all around change and all. And so we can really help companies design a whole curriculum and so often you'll have a problem in an organization and they try to solve it at the organizational level, but the real problem is the leader has never really dealt with who they are and what their ego problems are and all those kinds of things. So you can't solve that at the organizational level. That should have been done ahead of time. And so we even have a couple of graduate programs that we're, we're a key on where we move people through that whole movement from self to one-on-one -on -one to teams to organization. And, so I think that's one of the really powerful things that we've been able to do with companies here in UK and all is to give them a perspective on the journey to be an effective leadership and it's it's something that that you don't just sort of jump in to. Yeah. See, it's interesting. So it starts again with with self and and one of the uh, one of I was listening to you, the to the CD and you said that you should start you should even write your own obituary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What was the point you were making with that? Well, you know, this three, I think everybody should have a compelling vision, you know, which uh, I wrote a book called Full Steam Ahead with Jesse yeah. Stoner on visioning for companies. But most people don't have a vision, which is what, what, what's your purpose? You know, why are you here? Yeah. You know, and then second is what's your picture of the future? If you do a good job and your purpose, what will happen? And I, I got interested in obituaries when I read the old story about Alfred Nobel, you know, the Nobel Peace Prize. And, all yeah. that uh, part of the beginning of the last century, uh, his brother died in Stockholm. And uh, uh, when he went to the newspaper to read the obituary on his brother, they had he and his brother mixed up. And Alfred Nobel had been involved in the invention of dynamite. And uh, so what was the whole obituary? It was about destruction and all that. And he was devastated that that's how he was going to be remembered. So he called friends and loved ones around. And so what's the opposite of destruction? They said peace. And so he redesigned his life so he'd be remembered for peace, not for uh, destruction. <clears throat> so, uh, so I've written my own obituary. Every morning I read my mission statement, I look at my obituary, and then I have a set of operating values which uh, should guide my behavior. And, and organizations need the same. What business are you in? What are you, what are you heading for and all? And then. Once you have a compelling vision, then you can put goals in there. But most organizations, you know, never communicate well where they're heading and what they're trying to accomplish and what's going to guide their journey. Let's talk about that, if we can, the, the, the power of vision. Because in your book, Leading at a li Higher Level, you've got a whole uh, chapter focused on setting the right target. Yeah. But you also point out that, I think in the U.S., less than 10% of organizations really have done this right. meaningfully, mm -hmm. and people are living and breathing it. And if they do have it, it may be in a filing cabinet, sure. as you said, or on the wall in a nice mm -hmm. plaque, but it's not integrated. Yes. So first of all, why is it so important that organizations have a meaningful living vision? Well, I'm a big believer in, in servant leadership. Situational leadership is a servant leadership model. And when I mention servant leadership to people, they think you're talking about the inmates running the prison or trying to please people or some kind of religious movement. No, there's two parts of servant leadership. One is the leadership part, which is where are we going, what do we stand for, what are we trying to accomplish? Yeah. And that's why vision is so important, you know, because it tells, a compelling vision tells people who you are, what's your purpose, where you're going, your picture of the future, and what's going to guide your journey, your values. And then you put your goals on. And, and without that, then you know, you got a bureaucracy. You got people quacking like ducks and 
and all that because they don't know what the big picture purpose is, what they're trying to accomplish. Now, once people are real clear on, on the vision and direction, which has to come from the hierarchy, doesn't mean that you don't involve people, but it's the responsibility of the hierarchy. Then the second part of servant leadership is implementation, which is now you turn the pyramid upside down, and this is the servant part of servant leadership. So now you basically work for your people so right. that they can, what, live according to the vision and the values and accomplish the goals and all that. So many organizations, they want to leave this pyramid alive and well, you know, for implementation, and then everybody's sitting around with their, their you know, arms crossed evaluating and judging people and all that. That doesn't build trust. That doesn't build good, good, good teams and all that. So that's right. why, you know, we think it's so important to first have the right target that's the beginning of leading at a higher level. And then you can start focusing on the customer and then focusing on your people. And the reason it impacts focusing on the customer is that if you leave the traditional hierarchy in live and wealth implementation, what everybody's doing is they're sucking up the hierarchy, you know, because, uh, you know, if there's a difference between a customer need and what your supervisor wants, the supervisor wins. Mm -hmm. And everybody's going, quack, quack, it's our policy, quack, quack, I don't work here, quack, quack. You know, you want to talk to our supervisor and all that kind of thing. Where if you have a great organization, they have a clear vision and values that's driven from the top, but then they turn the pyramid upside down, and now you know everybody works for everybody. And I think that's probably one of the really brilliance of, of Branson and his whole brand. I, his whole organizations are set up to empower people at the top of the organization. And that's why Virgin Airlines is a, is a pleasure to fly because the people actually act like you're important as a customer. Uh, and where you re get other airlines that are run by bureaucracies. I mean, I remember the last time I was here, you know, I, I didn't know you could only take one bag on, you know, and kept, yet coming from the U.S., you can take a, a, you know, a briefcase and a roll bag, and I oh, so, you know, I, mean, I thought they were going to make me eat the bag, you know. I mean, <laughs> and quack, I mean, the ducks were, you know, uh, flying and all that kind of thing. And so you'd think that the organization was about rules and regulations, not about serving customers. Yeah. And you talk about the experience as well, like, you know, talking about the customer experience. And I suppose that's what the net result is of turning the organization pyramid upside yes, down. That's right, yeah. You know, um, could you talk to us about um, the, the three stages? Number one is building a crystal clear uh, and significant purpose, which is making sure that you really know what organization, what, what industry or what business you're really in. Mm -hmm. I think you talked about Disney at one point. Being yeah, well, most organizations, I was working with a bank recently, and they sent me their mission statement. And I, when I got in front of the president and the chairman, I said, I appreciate your sending me your mission statement because I've slept so much better. <laughs> you know, since I got it, because I put it next to my bed, and if I couldn't sleep at night, I would read your mission statement. I mean, it was just, you went on, you know, we're in the financial services, we do, the, you know, couldn't motivate anybody. I said, I think you're in the peace of mind business. If I gave you money, I would like to have the peace of mind uh, that you would take my money and protect it and grow it. So they're in the financial peace of mind business. When Disney started his park, he said, we're in the happiness business. He didn't say we're in the theme park. Uh, business and the reason people smile and are friendly there because they're in the happiness business, you know. Right. And uh, so you got to know what what business you're in and and uh, make it really clear for for people uh, around you. So that's what your purpose is. And the picture of the future is what will happen if you do your job well. And at Disney, that he said this, the every guest leaving the park will have the same smile leaving the park as when they entered six, eight, ten, twelve hours right. before. You know, I mean. You, you can't guarantee that, but that's your picture of perfection. And then what, what guides people's behavior is their values. And most organizations don't have values. If they do, they usually have too many, 6, 8, 10, 12, and they're not rank ordered. If they're not rank ordered, they're basically useless because values are, you know, we have value conflicts. So the number one value at Disney is safety. Right. You know, and uh, why is that important? Because, you know, Walt said if somebody gets carried out of one of the parks on a stretcher, you know, because they got hurt, they're not going to have the same smile on their face <laughs> leaving the park. So our first value is safety. Second value is courtesy and friendliness and all. The reason that's important, if I'm answering a question for a person in a courteous, friendly way and I hear a scream coming, 
uh, and it's not coming from a roller coaster, I need to dismiss myself and head for the screen. Why? Because the number one value just called. If they're not rank ordered, and I'm talking to some good looking woman or I'm thinking about what she's going to do <laughs> it after she leaves the park, I might say, ah, they're always screaming in the park. <laughs> Somebody comes to you, you were the closest to the screen, why didn't you move? Well, I was dealing with courtesy. Well, you don't deal with courtesy if there's a safety issue. Right. Their third uh, value is the show, which is you're either on, in, in role or, or not, you know. And uh, so uh, if you're playing Mickey Mouse or reception, so they have a playbook, you know, so you're mm -hmm. either on stage or off stage. And then the last value is efficiency, running a profitable, well-run organization. Most people don't have anything about profit or financial success in their values. Everybody immediately knows the values are, are useless because if you have financial problems, everybody focuses on it. So you can see that compelling vision really says, and now we can set goals, which are what you want people to focus on short term. So that makes sure you have the right target. And once the target is clear, now that drives the behavior as you deal with your people and you deal with your customers. Talking about values, um, in our research we spoke to Janet in your London office mm -hmm. um, and she was very proud of the values uh, at the Ken Blanchard companies, yes. particularly how you enforce them after 9-11, mm -hmm. which wasn't good for any organization yes. with uh, US offices, but particularly one in training where there was still bums on seats needed. Sure. So can you tell us about how the values helped you through that time? Well, we have four rank order values. The first one is ethical, doing the right thing. Uh, second one is our relationships with our people, our customers, our suppliers, our community. Third is success, which is running a profitable, well-run organization. And number four is learning. And uh, so, you know, we lost, you know, 1.5 million in sales in September of 9-11 uh, and uh, realized on October 1st we we're going to have to cut about 350000 a month for three months to limp in uh, to the thing. And so... You know, what do most organizations do? Well, we ought to let's chop people and all that kind of thing. But, you know, given our values, we say, what is the right thing to do? Well, the right thing to do is, I think, is to share information with your people. Make your people your business partner. So once a quarter, we always share our bottom line uh, stuff, even share where we are with our bank loans and all that kind of thing. My wife had and I had a belief from when we started the company, if we have problems, we want everybody to lose sleep. <laughs> not just us. And uh, off of that, we started forming task forces to look at how we could cut costs, how we could increase revenue. And, you know, people agreed to take some salary cuts and some things to kind of manage some of the costs and all. And uh, one of the things we said is when we pull out of this thing, I said, we're all going to go to Hawaii to celebrate. And a year and a half or so later, we took 350 people to Holly, you know, to Hawaii for a four day party. Uh, to celebrate uh, what what we had uh, done, and I think that because you know success is important, but we wanted to do it the right way, and our people are really important uh, yeah. to us. And and uh, if we can do things with those two values, and also uh, figure it out, and we're 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 trying that again. You know, I mean, we're like everybody else. We're down twenty, twenty five percent, and how yeah. can we? Uh, pull this thing together without losing a lot of people's jobs and, and all. So we've been doing all kinds of things to to uh, involve our people in, in ways that we can uh, get through this whole economic downturn yeah. Uh, yeah. in a whole way rather than, you know, the owners going behind closed doors and trying to decide things. We'd just soon be open with people. That's right. And then you've got the two-way dialogue because employees have great ideas as well, yes. stakeholders in the business to have solutions. Sure. Um, Ken, if we can just talk about leadership uh, now. Um, I understand you're a, you're a fan of Nelson, Nelson Mandela. Sure. What, what do you think are some of the lessons we can learn specifically from Nelson? Well, Mandela? it was interesting. Uh, when I came up with the idea of the writing the book, Leading at a Higher Level, yeah. we, Margie and I had been heading off to a safari in Africa. And about a week before, we were at a dinner party. And the, the host and hostess said, why don't we go around the table and say, if you could have dinner with anybody in the world uh, that's still living, who would you like to have dinner with? And when it got to me, it was an easy choice. I said, I'd like to have dinner with Nelson Mandela. I'd love to have dinner with a guy who's in jail for 28 years, treated uh, poorly and all, comes out of fully love, compassion, reconciliation, and all. And so I got a, a copy of a 
long walk to freedom about his life and was reading that as I was heading over to the jungle. And we had been in the jungle before, but off of that, I realized uh, some things about the jungle more vividly than before. It's very competitive. It's very territorial, you know. I mean, when a lion roars, what the lion really is saying, you know, it's mine, mine, mine. And if you listen to a recording of a lion, that sounds what they're doing. This baby, this is my territory. You mess with me, you know, and quite vicious and, and all. And I realized that, you know, uh, we as human beings have some choices that the other animals don't, you know. Mm -hmm. And we have a choice every day whether we want to, you know, be self-interested, it's all about us, or we want to be interested in the greatest good for the greatest number. And that's a choice uh, that people make. And, and so I said, wow, what a, what a difference with the leaders who basically think that their job is to serve rather than be served. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, what Mandela's whole philosophy is, that was Gandhi's whole philosophy uh, was, you know, it wasn't about them. It was about what's best for the greatest number and of people and all. And so um, uh, I think we can learn a lot from uh, those kinds of leaders. And we need more servant leaders, I think, in the world mm -hmm. rather than people that think it's all about themselves. I mean, you've run into some problems here with your uh, government officials, you know, acting like it's yeah. all about them and all. And certainly we've had that. And, you know, you can go around the world. And I think we ought to just, you know, finally just stomp our foot and say we're just not going to put up with it. Mm -hmm. That, uh, you know, I would interview any candidate that you want to have for the next prime minister and all and say, tell me about how you're going to be a servant leader. What are you going to mm -hmm. do to show that this is, that you're going to be a problem solver, not all about getting elected next time. And yeah. we don't need people in that, you know. And so it's a, I was a government major as an undergraduate and, in America, the Founding Fathers never anticipated politics would be a career. The House of Representatives is two years. Why? Because they thought, well, you could give up two years of your life to go serve the government because you couldn't fly back and forth at those times. The only reason Senate was longer was they thought somebody ought to know the town. Uh, but they never thought that, you know, people would want to get reelected and all that. So you have seniority and all that kind of thing. I mean. Uh, we, we really need people in our government that are there to serve rather than be served, to solve problems rather than, you know, to build their own power base. Again, if, if somebody is uh, driven mostly by their own ego or by their pursuit of their own cars, helicopters, houses, whatever, but it's all about self, then can somebody transform themselves into a servant leader? or? Is it, do you have to innately be born with that characteristic, do you think? Do they need to have well, a massive paradigm shift? people have asked me about how you can shift people. I, I only know three ways. One, a near-death experience is very helpful. Uh, <laughs> I've never known anybody who almost died that didn't come out and kind of look at life a little bit differently. Does Second, the Ken Blanchard companies offer that service? <laughs> yeah. Second is, I, I think, some kind of spiritual awakening. I think people who really you know, get involved in a higher power, and it's not to say that there's one right, wrong one. I've, I've found, uh, you know, are different. And the third is if they have a really good role model that they admire and all. But is it hard to turn somebody around? I think it is. You mm -hmm. know, I think sometimes uh, people uh, just come out of the, the shoot and and uh, and all we all come into the world self-serving. I mean, yeah. baby gets home from the hospital, doesn't say, you know, how can I help around the house? They yell, and everybody runs around. Yeah. And uh, it's a journey to move from being self-serving to serving, mm. and uh, that's one that you really want. You know, yeah. uh, uh, you want to ask questions of people. You know, what what's in their life that that made them? I mean, like. Uh, my dad was an admiral in the Navy and, and well decorated in the Second World War. And I'll never forget in the seventh grade, I got elected president of the class, you know, it was mm. the beginning of junior high school. And I came home, I'm all proud. And my dad says, Congratulations, Ken, but now that you have that position, don't ever use it. He said, Great leaders are great because people respect and trust them, not because they have power. Mm. I mean, he started giving me lessons. And all, you know, and you would think that it was strange coming from a military uh, guy, but my father said this whole baloney my way or the highway is just crazy, particularly into 
into battle. I mean, if your men don't trust you and all, they'll shoot you before the enemy gets you, you know. And mm -hmm. uh, he said, you know, if you don't hear what the problems are from your men, you know, watch your tail. You're going over the side, you know. They've cut you off and you're nothing without your people. And I mean, I was just constantly, constantly given lessons uh, uh, about that. So even before I got into the study of leadership, I, <clears throat> I knew that that was uh, the way it needed to be. Yeah, because um, I know that uh, Nelson Mandela, for example, Time Magazine voted him as one of the top uh, leaders of all time, and one of the things they cited was his smile yes. as, a, as a sort of powerful leadership lesson. And some, as you said, some of the most simple things for can sure. get forgotten. Yeah. What about Barack Obama, Ken? I mean, he's uh, now the CEO of the USA. Um, what would you say are some of the lessons we can learn, either from how he got into victory or into, into power, or since he's taken office? Well, you know, it was really fascinating to see how he got elected because he was running a, you know, 2010 campaign and Hillary and his Republican candidate were running 1990s campaigns. I mean, he was using the internet. He was using technology and all. So he's a really smart uh, guy, and uh, but it's a tough job. He's inherited probably the toughest circumstances of any president probably since Franklin Delano Roosevelt, you know, after mm -hmm. World War uh, II. And so, uh, you know, I, I think he's got the, got the real potential. I just hope he gathers people around him that, that help him because, you know, he doesn't have a lot of experience, no. uh, you know, in, in uh, you know, being a leader per se. I mean, he was a community organizer and, and he's a, you know, was a senator and all that kind of thing. So, but... Uh, I think around the world, I think people are optimistic because he seems to have an open hand uh, attitude, less talk, you know, and I think that's, that's what, you know, people have been kidding about him getting the Nobel Peace Prize, but I think they were reinforcing uh, a sense or a philosophy that, that they got from him that, that the world really needs, particularly from somebody from America, which is less talk rather than less, you know, label you. Uh, and uh, so uh, it, it's it's really too early to decide. And he's got all kinds of issues to to deal with, uh, uh, both economically and and his international relations. So um, we'll just have to have to see. Yeah, but one of the things I've noticed is that he's adopted the mindset of yes, we can, mm -hmm. which is uh, important, I think, for yeah. any nation or organization to have. That. I think I think he's a possibility thinker. And I also have admired so far is that he's made a few mistakes and he uh, apologizes for them and takes credit for them. I haven't seen him blame anybody. He had a couple of appointments where uh, it turns out that they had some background stuff that somebody should have checked on. And he didn't say that was their fault. He'd say, hey, you know, you know, it's, I, I can't shift the responsibility, so I apologize. That, that, was, uh, that was a goof. Ken, uh, one of your most famous books um, was like, well, there's a lot of them, but if we can just pick on raving fans mm -hmm. for, a, for a minute. Um, can we just ask, first of all, a, a very open question. It's rather embarrassing, but how do you create raving fans, Ken? Well, raving fans says that satisfying your customers is not enough. What you got to do is create a situation where they go, whoa, I can't quite believe that, you know? And... Sometimes it's not a real complicated thing. For example, I'm blown away when I ask for a wake-up call in a hotel and I get a human being, yeah. you know, because the Imagine most common wake-up call, you pick the phone up and there's nobody there, but they rang the phone. Second most common is you get, uh, you know, a, a recording and you're usually in the middle of it, but you're just blown away when you get a human being. I remember going to a hotel in, in Orlando, Florida one time, a big Marriott, and I asked for a 7 o'clock wake-up, and this woman rang the phone and said, Good morning, Dr. Blanchard. It's 7 o'clock. It's going to be 75 and beautiful today, but your ticket says you're leaving. Where are you going? And I said, <laughs> I'm going to New York City. She said, New York City. I got the USA Today weather map here. Let me look. Oh, no, it's going to be 40 and rainy in New York. Can't you stay another day? <laughs> I mean, so that's just so unusual. Sheldon Bowles, who I wrote the book with, in the 1970s, when everybody was going to self-service gasoline, he said, what a fabulous time for full service because there'll be no competition. And what he did is he wanted to create a special thing because he knew that nobody wanted to go to the gas station if they didn't have to. 
So he uh, hired a bunch of housewives and retirees and all the maybe I wore four hours a day, and he dressed them up in red jumpsuits. And uh, his whole goal was that when you came in there, it was like a pit stop at Monte Carlo, you know, <laughs> and you know these people would race at your car and somebody under the hood, somebody pumping gas, somebody open the door, ask you to step out and give you a cup of coffee and a newspaper and dust bust your car. I mean, he just created raving fans. So it's constantly saying, what can we do and we interact with our customers in a way that just, just blows them away, you know? I mean, uh, like Southwest Airlines, which is uh, only d flies in the U.S., but, um, you know, how many times have you called an airline and, and you get these recordings, you know? And they said, I'm sorry, all the line is busy, you know, and, and we'll be with you. And then they throw on the music and all. You call Southwest, and if they usually have a human being answer, but if they're not, you say that says, "I'm sorry, everybody's busy." At the beep, leave your name and your telephone number, and we'll get back to you in ten minutes. And so you hang up, and you can go and do other things. All of a sudden, your phone rings, and it says, "Ken Blanche of Southwest Airlines. How can we help you?" Whoa, you know, I mean, so yeah. that's just that doing that little extra that just blows people's mind. So uh, sort of really thinking about what the ideal customer experience yes. and then working back from that and then just sure. incorporating it. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, your cabbies are wonderful here in, in uh, London, you We're know, proud compared of to a lot of... <laughs> on, but I, I tell you, I ran into a cabbie one time that just blew my mind, you know, because, uh, you know, it, uh, he charges around, you know, and his car looked like it was clean and, you know, mm -hmm. this is New York City and, and he said, hi, my name's Harold, I'm your cab driver, and while I'm putting your bags in the car, here's my mission statement. Gave me a car with a mission statement, you know. It's Howard's, uh, you know, mission to get you to your location in the quickest, safest, cheapest way possible within a friendly environment. You know, and I go, oh, you know, and, and then you get in the car, and here's a guy, you know, who says, I got, uh, you know, Coke, I got 7-Up, I got water and all, what would you like to drink, you know, and, and uh, I got you know, two or three newspapers, you know, I mean, yes. this guy just, you know, and I said, well, how long have you been doing this, you know? And he said, you know, you know, about a year and a half. I said, what did you do before? He said, I was like everybody else complaining, too many cabs and all that. And I just looked around and everybody was not taking care of customers and they were complaining when they didn't get tips, you know. Right. And your cabbies here are just very friendly and they're incredibly knowledgeable because it takes a long while to get to be a cab because I think they're your ambassadors, you know, and so people really could learn a lot from that, you know, so I'm a raving fan of, of uh, the cab service in, in England and I, I think that's again, what, what can we do to be different? Yeah, yeah. And I bet that cabbie in New York was uh, his, 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 one of his values, which you say is allowed, yeah. it's just got to be ranked, is, is generating profit, because I bet you he had more tips than anybody else. Absolutely, sure, <laughs> and so why wouldn't why you? Why wouldn't? Yeah. It's fantastic. Um, you also talk about moments of truth, sort of, I think that, uh, when you say that, do you mean sort of points of contact with customers? Is that what moments it's of truth? A, it's a Jan Carlson concept. He was the president of Scandinavian Airline System in the 1980s and kind of turned that airline around. And yeah. He said, we're not going to beat the competition because we have good airplanes. We don't have good airplanes. We're not even the game. So you're not going to beat the competition because you have a good product. If you don't have a good product, you're not in the game. He said, we're not going to beat the competition because we have the lowest price. You don't want to get in a price war. But we're going to beat the competition on moment's truth, which is any time a customer comes in contact with your organization in the way they can get an impression. That's a moment of truth. And each department in an organization needs to look at what are our customer contacts? And it's not just external touch customers because personnel has internal customers and yet a lot of personnel departments and companies act like the people are the enemy, you know, rather than their, their customers and all. And so how do you manage those moments of truth in a different way? If you walk in our corporate headquarters in, in California, the main building, uh, there's a desk there where we have two or three operators answering the phone and greeting people, and it says in the counter, directors of first impressions. And they think that that's their job. And you can't get into voicemail in our company unless you ask for it. You know, we have a human being answers the phone, you know, because we think that's an important moment of truth, mm -hmm. where a lot of companies don't. They're, I think they're pound-wise and a penny foolish, 
by having machines answer their phones and frustrate their customers. Is it, how important is it to get that culture by making sure you hire what you were talking about between eagles and ducks before, making sure you're hiring the eagles as opposed to the ducks in the first place, do you think? Well, I think that's really important. You know, you can hire for skill or character, yeah. you know, and I think you can train for skills, but you need to have people who have that kind of servant attitude and all. And I think yeah. that's so interesting in Southwest Airlines, when they interview a frontline employee, they televise the interview, they, they tape the interview, but they don't tape the person, they tape the people that are interviewing them because they want to yeah. see how they're responding to them. How am so, I doing with you? I'm so we, well, we would have to see whether we'd hire you because you've got okay. a good smiling face. And, you know, <laughs> but what it would say is, how, how are you responding to me? Right. Which is more important than, than yeah. putting the camera on me. Right. And so, yeah, I think you have to hire people that, that uh, get a kick out of serving people and then Absolutely. give them the training and the skills to, to do it. You, you talk about making sure that you've got raving fans in the organization, you've got the ideal experience, but you still have to link it back to the systems and energizing systems, is that right? Absolutely, you know, if you have an organization that's big on rules and regulations and policies and all, and everybody's got to follow them to the order, then you've got a problem. What you want is policies should be guidelines but you want your people to use their brains before they rules, use rules, regulations, or uh, policies. And so that uh, there, there could be exceptions and people be, need to be able to know that they can bring their brains to work and, and the customer knows that, wow, this person's a problem solver. Ken, you've dedicated your career so far very much to helping individuals and organizations better themselves and to be as good as they possibly can be. So if there's one piece of advice you'd give to an individual now to make sure they can be the best they can be, what would that be? I'd say the biggest advice I'd give people is to recognize that leadership is not all about you. Uh, it's really about your people and accomplishment of goals. And, and if the focus is on you, you're never going to make it. The focus should be on them. You're there to serve, not to be served. And I think you finally become an adult when you realize uh, that. And we just need to have more leaders that are there to serve and solve problems and help people win than they are to accumulate money, recognition, and power for themselves. Fantastic. Can I think you've given us so many insights today, and I know you've got, I've, I've been a raving fan of yours for a very long time. I've watched your DVDs and CDs and things, and so thank you very much for that. If people want to follow up and get in contact with you or get more information from your companies, how would they go about doing that? Well, in, here in the UK, they can call the, you know, the Ken Blanchard uh, companies and, okay. and, uh, and California and all. And we, we, they can go on a website, uh, KenBlanchard.com, which refers okay. to all of our uh, sites around the, the world. And, and when you call our people, their first question is to try to find out what are you working on? What do you need help on? Uh, because we don't uh, have program and we'll jam it down your throat. We're constantly saying, what is your issue? Because one of the things is that we can help companies in so many different ways around the whole vision and direction, around customers, around their people, around leadership training, team building, you know, yeah. all of those kinds of things. So it's uh, really been exciting. Our whole goal is uh, to make the behavioral sciences come alive so that organizations are, are, are really make a difference. We want to help people and organizations lead at a higher level. Ken, I just want to say thank you very much indeed for your time today. I, to, for, to make this interview happen, I had to do some research and just watching your CDs, reading your books again, watching you on YouTube, watching you on KenBlanchard.com has been a phenomenal insight for me. Great learning experience. So thank you so very much indeed for your time. Well, good. It's good to be with you. It's been fun. Thank you.